Uh, I'd just like to thank Charles for that introduction. Uh, it's, it's probably a little overblown, but certainly uh, uh, nothing that I can't bask in, whether it's all true or not. Uh, I, I would say the one thing that he didn't tell you about me is that I love Latin American music, or as we used to call it when I was a kid, South American music. Uh, and uh, I, I, I have often thought about why on earth did I uh, uh, like this so much? I mean, it's good music, obviously, but, but why has it always sort of appealed to me? And I got to thinking about that one time some time back, and I realized that <clears throat> I was born in 1939. Now, the, the uh, uh, golden age of radio is generally considered to be the 30s and 40s. So I was born kind of right in the middle of that. And my uh, brother was older than me. So he was in school when I was, you know, what, two or whatever. And uh, 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 my mom was a stay at home mother. Uh, and my dad worked. And uh, this is, of course, prior to the war, World War II. But uh, uh, South American music was a very popular genre in the 40s. And my mom always had the radio on. And so I think I heard this stuff from the time that I was young enough uh, that it, it has just stuck with me and I've always loved the music. But how would that even happen if it weren't for radio? So I think this is kind of an important thing to think about is that, that media does have an influence on our lives. We've learned that certainly lately with social media, but let me go on. Uh, the, Charles said to me, I want you to talk about radio. Now, that, that's pretty wide open. And normally, uh, when I uh, uh, like taught a class at radio, I, I spent a whole semester doing this. So to try to compress it down into an hour is going to be a chore. Uh, but but uh, uh, I would say, uh, what do we have here? We have how it works. We have federal regulation. We have programming. I'll try to touch on... Uh, all of this just a little bit. Uh, and, and then if you have questions at the end of this, why you can ask, I don't know if I'll be able to answer because I'm not nearly the authority that I think these people believe I am. Uh, but, but let me just go on. Okay, when it comes to uh, mass communication and or, or just communication over a long distance, why in history, what did we have? We had like runners. This is, I think, where the marathon thing came from. You know, somebody at the battlefield runs back to the king and talks about it or what have you. Well, that isn't very efficient. Certainly, it takes a while. Uh, then we move from there to things that also developed, or at least the myth is, that in, in the jungle when there were drums. And you would have a relay of drums so that if like a, a, a warring tribe was coming toward uh, the other tribe, why somebody would start beating the drums and then the, the person next in the relay would hear the drums and repeat it for uh, the, the one after that until it got back to home base and people knew that somebody was coming. So, and, and one of the things that's really important to think about here is that the drums are sending a code. That is, there's a particular rhythm. It isn't just somebody beating on a drum. There's a rhythm that says, you know, these people are coming, or there's a rhythm that maybe says something else. So uh, that, that was uh, a very primitive way to communicate. Well, we moved, of course, to mail, and we moved on, on long distances in this country to the Pony Express for a while. And, you know, the Pony Express lasted, I think, only about six months, something like that. Everybody romanticizes the big deal. But this is riding horses in relays across the country to deliver mail fast. And it still took quite a while. I can't remember the exact time from St. Louis to uh, San Francisco or whatever. But it took time, but it was certainly faster than any other method of mail. This was replaced in, what, 1844, by the telegraph. That's why it only lasted about six months because the telegraph took over. Uh, they got it all wired across the country. Now, again, I mentioned about the drums sending a code. Well, the telegraph used Morse code. And again, it's setting up a pattern of clicks which work electronically. That is to say that 
we're feeding a current here. We, we close the circuit. That powers a magnet down at this end, which pulls a clicker up toward it and it makes a click. So then you start having all these clicks and the next thing, you know, why somebody can, you can send a message with, with uh, the number of uh, words that are uh, typed from the other end. And so this is almost instantaneous when it's electronic. Well, that's, that was a big jump. It was 30 years later when Alexander Graham Bell of one, I think that they've talked about there are maybe nine uh, of people in the world who were inventing the telephone about the same time, but Bell is certainly giving credit for it. And that was in uh, eight, uh, 1876 that he, you know, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you uh, sort of thing. And uh, the telephone worked. Well, how the telephone works, you know, when we make sound, why we do this with our breath. And I'm sure you know this, that sound waves move through the air, uh, depending on how we articulate what happens with our lips. Or, you know, if we make any kind of a sound, why it moves a vibration through the air. And it's a particularly, again, it's kind of a coded vibration. And so what the telephone did was take, in essence, a microphone, which could take those vibrations in the air and turn them into vibrations or, uh, 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 well, shoot, <laughs> electronic signals that were in essence almost vibrating themselves. And those go to the other end, which work on a headphone, which pulls the, uh, 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 again, a magnet pulls a, a little uh, diaphragm, metal diaphragm. And that in turn reproduces the uh, vibrations that I did with my voice to start with. And this is how a phone works. Okay, that was great. Uh, but you had to have wires to make it work. Well, the shipping was a big deal back in those days and trade was very important. And so certainly it would have been nice if we, could, we couldn't very well string wires to a ship, but it would have been nice if we'd be able to communicate over a long distance, such as when the Titanic was sinking. And so consequently, why uh, Hertz, you know, you've heard of megahertz with, uh, uh, again, uh, how many how many cycles in sound for your hi-fi or whatever it is. So Hertz uh, d demonstrated in, uh, again, let me see here. Uh, he demonstrated radio waves in the late 1800s. He showed that this was possible, but it, it wasn't anything like what we consider to be radio. It just showed that something, again, could be articulated or manipulated uh, but through the air. And what it was was what we call a carrier wave. That's, that's radio, of course. Well, uh, uh, in 1874, why uh, Marconi was born. And 26 years later, why he, or 27 years later, why he was able to uh, send the first transatlantic uh, radio signal. Again, this was just with Morse code. It's on and off, on and off. It wasn't nearly as complicated as the telephone. But of course, that got changed after some time. And uh, we were able to, again, manipulate these carrier waves. Now, what are they? That's it. Carrier wave gets modulated. It's a particular part of the uh, energy spectrum that we all live in, all the radiation we live in. Why we pick this particular part, and that's what uh, Hertz uh, discovered and uh, theorized and then discovered uh, why uh, we're able to manipulate the strength of that signal. And there's two ways to do that. One is what you call uh, amplitude modulation, which really is strength of the signal. And it gets stronger, it gets weaker, it gets stronger very, very fast because of course, why we have uh, frequencies moving from our mouths or any other sound uh, at different rates of speed. And this is what our ears interpret the ears kind of work like the headphone works. The ears translate it back into, into your head. Well, amplitude modulation was the first uh, part of the signal that they were able to use. And, and it was very effective. And it was able to then work on ships and what have you. And not only on ships, but then of course it developed, but it was with Morse code. Well, it wasn't too long before it was developed into um, uh, using the use of microphones and what have you and making more complex signals so we could send voices and a radio began in this country. Uh, but 
there's another way to do it. That's called frequency modulation. And that's where the signal uh, goes up and down very, very fast in terms of, of waves. And the thing about frequency modulation, amplitude modulation is AM, frequency modulation is FM. Uh, why the way the way that works uh, is that uh, it it actually is in a much larger area of frequency reproduction, and consequently the fidelity is so much better. Uh, but amplitude modulation AM radios were everywhere, and so people are saying, "Well, why should I get? Why should I spend the money for this newfangled thing?" Uh, the the positives are that that. Uh, the, the hi-fi of the FM is really much better, uh, but the, the amplitude will actually curve around the earth. The signal will actually go around the earth, whereas FM is line of sight from the tip of your tower to the horizon is as far as it will go. Uh, this is one of the reasons why like Channel 12 has that tall tower up in Hutchinson that they broadcast their signal through the air if, if if you don't have cable TV, uh, television sound is FM. And so consequently, you have to have a line of sight. I was up on that tower one time at the very top, and you could see Wichita from there. It was amazing. You know, what, 40, 40 miles, something like that. Anyway, moving right along, um, I came to Wichita in uh, 1957 to college. And as Charles said, the Municipal University of Wichita, that's what the MUW and KMUW is in the radio station there. Uh, KMUW was a, the first, as Charles said, the first 10 watt uh, public radio station in the United States uh, that was granted a license. Uh, my first experience with radio was as a sophomore in high school, we had radio production class and that was really cool. I, re because I was into drama and all this sort of stuff. So we had this radio production class and, and uh, we learned all how the system worked and all this sort of stuff. And we practice and did little projects with our equipment that we had there. And then uh, toward the end of the, of the year, why we broadcast uh, a radio drama on station WTRC there in Elkhart, Indiana, which is where I grew up. And it was Daniel Boone and I got to play Daniel Boone. So this really sticks in my head. Anyway, I came to, I came to Wichita in 1957 as a drama major, but I learned that they had uh, this radio station. And I thought, hey, that would be cool. So I went over and it was all student operated at the time. I mean, it was supervised, of course, by the head of the department, but it, it was all student operated. And we were on the air from four in the afternoon till nine o'clock at night. This was an FM station only. Now, there were only two FM stations in the city at that time. That was us, that was KMUW, and that was KFH, AM, and FM. They, they multicast. Uh, on both AM and FM, uh, but with just 10 watts with our station, why, you know, you were lucky if you could hear it down the street sort of thing. Actually, my wife, or she wasn't my wife at the time, she had a TV set that she could set on channel six and then play with the fine tuning and she could tune in the FM that we, that we were broadcasting. Uh, but we broadcast news, jazz, um, classical music, uh, uh, and with the news, why we had an AM transmitter or an AP machine, pardon me. We had an AP machine, Associated Press, which printed out news. And so we could do a little newscast. And this was a good, great practice for us. Um, um, I uh, was, uh, my first professional job in broadcasting was as an announcer at Channel 12. And that's back when it was KTVH. And the thing about it was, was that uh, they had three regular, what they call booth announcers, because back then, why it was all mechanical. It was just like a radio station in the booth. Uh, you, you had to open uh, what they called the pots, the switches, and set the volume. For like the soundtracks off of commercials, you had to open it for yourself to say, this is KTVH Channel 12, Wichita Hutchinson. And you had to, uh, now in its eighth year, <laughs> that's where I was back then. And now in its eighth year of broadcasting, uh, but they had these three announcers, and they took simult or they took vacations in order, and so consequently uh, they hired me to fill in for each one of those three guys when when each one was gone. So it was a six week job, 
But the important thing was that I knew how to do it because of what I'd learned with, with KMUW. I, at KMUW, we had, a, uh, we had two turntables. We had two tape machines. We had a microphone. Uh, and then we had, a, we had a bigger studio because this was also used to teach radio classes. And we had a small, small, about five by five little booth to do the news in. Uh, and this was essentially what I was doing. Then I went out to Channel 12. So, so kudos to KMUW as a student station for that. Now, let's talk just briefly. I'm going to have to watch this because I tend to run off of the mouth, as I'm sure you can tell. But federal regulation came in. Well, originally, when radio first got going, it was, it was the Wild West. It really was just a free-for-all. Uh, you could have a small station, say, 100 watts broadcasting. And uh, on a frequency, a particular frequency, whatever there's was, what you tuned to, you know, on your radio. And a, a bigger station that was broadcasting, say, a thousand watts, could grab that same frequency and just overwrite their signal and just ruin it. Well, so consequently, why the feds realized that something had to be done here uh, to try to make this uh, make more sense. Uh, the the uh, Federal Communications was originally the uh, Federal Radio Commission, uh, but they knew that TV was coming down the line. So eventually they changed it to the, the FCC, which of course you've heard about. Well, well, why else do you need this besides some station overriding another station? Because there was a lot of, of crazy stuff going on on the radio. And one of those things was Dr. Uh, John Brinkley, whom you may have heard of, he was right here in Kansas. He, was, he wasn't from Kansas, but but he ended up settling in Milford, Kansas. He was known as the goat gland doctor. Now, if you've never heard of this, this, this man actually made a fortune uh, by taking advantage of people like me uh, who have perhaps uh, less virility than they once had. And he would actually transplant goat testicles into these people. <laughs> and, and he made a fortune at it. it you know, it just, who knows, but, but whatever the case, why well, he put a radio station on there and that station was KFKB. And then he was really able, it was a thousand watts, he was really able to contact people and, uh, you know, um, spread his, oh, he's had cures for all sorts of things and what have you. I mean, it really was just selling snake oil. Finally, why uh, he got discredited because they found out and, 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 uh, uh, that he didn't even have any medical training at all to start with. And so what he did was he went down to Del Rio, Texas, and he put a station uh, the facility on the, uh, this, our side of the Rio Grande, and he put a transmitter on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande, and consequently the FCC had no control over him. And that station was still actually on the air when I was in school here back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you could tune it in late at night. And again, it was selling stuff like the Eat with Jesus tablecloth or a splinter from the original cross. I mean, all sorts of just, you know, scams. Uh, but so consequently, this is one of the reasons why the FCC, you know, people say, gee, why do we need so much federal regulation? Well, that's, that's one of the reasons. Now, the... FCC set up that we need to broadcast to the public interest, convenience, and necessity. That's, that's a, at the top of the chart because they say the, the uh, airwaves belong to the public. And this had to be because there are limited frequencies that you can use to broadcast. And so um, uh, unlike, say, a newspaper where you can editorialize a newspaper and you can open up 20 newspapers in a city if you want to, why, with a radio station, there just aren't that many frequencies involved. Because it used to be that uh, radio station owners would say, why can't we editorialize? And they said, because the airwaves have to belong to the public because it's so limited as to how many stations can actually be on the air. So not just anybody can have one. So like I say, they said a public interest, convenience, and necessity. Well, public interest is things like uh, um, learning news and being entertained. Uh, convenience is the thing of having a station that you can tune in and, and it's clear and, and, and works okay. And necessity is uh, things like if a tornado is coming, 
and, and you can be notified of that. So, so this is a, a great deal of why the FCC was in. One other thing they did though was also ban obscenity, indecency, or profanity. And obscenity, of course, as generally is connected with body functions, particularly sexual stuff. Indecency is the same thing, but a lot less, and generally has to do with things like passing gas jokes and that sort of stuff. And then, of course, profanity is using the name of God in vain and that sort of stuff. Much of this deregulation has gone away as, as when they had the fairness doctrine and the equal time um, opportunity for people who did editorialize to have the opposition uh, have the same amount of time to come in and talk. Now, my professional broadcasting career was primarily, as Charles pointed out, in television and film. Uh, and, and you say, well, then what, what does that have to do with radio? Well, it's sad to say that back in the days, and this was in the 60s and early 70s, back in the day, why people didn't pay much attention to the soundtracks. Hey, we've got pictures. You know, this is a way to, to uh, uh, appeal to people. Well, I made commercials. I made documentaries. I made program elements. And uh, uh, so particularly the commercials, I got, I got kind of known for how good the soundtracks were. Uh, that that I you know it you know it's like you watch a movie and the music can determine how you feel a lot of times you can have a very bad actor and if you're playing some really sad music while he's dying why you you can start crying watching this uh, and 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 again this came from the radio experience and the appreciation of the overall medium to start with so that really helped me out uh, but then later why I went to work at uh, KMU, or KMUW, and this is in, let's see, 1978. Uh, I went to work at KMUW, as Charles pointed out, news director for six months, but then the program director left and I got promoted to program director. Now, again, we still had students. Um, at, at KMUW had affiliated with NPR, National Public Radio, in 1971. Well, this was 1978, but one of the requirements that you had to have to be a, an NPR affil is to have five professional staff members. And so that's what we had. We had uh, myself as, as program director. We had uh, Lewis Foster as, as a news director. Uh, we had Patty Cahill as the manager. We had my wife, Pat Hayes, as the uh, development director. And uh, we had uh, Jim... Uh, Gosh, what was his name? He was, he was the engineer. So we had those five people, but we still had a lot of students. Students did a lot of the broadcasting and we were still doing jazz. We were still doing classical music, but we also carried like All Things Considered, which is on KMUW right now. And if you haven't listened to that, why you should. And at the time, one morning edition started up about that time, which is All Things Considered, except early in the morning. And uh, then and NPR has, of course, added more and more shows. But again, why it's radio. And what are you getting out of it? You're getting the public interest stuff. You're getting all sorts. Because one thing about it, there are people who don't like what they hear on KMUW because they think it's slanted one way or the other. But it isn't. If you really go through and analyze the programming, why it is very balanced. They present both points of view. And you can learn from this because I think, in my opinion, one of the problems with the, with the social media and actually what's being broadcast like MSNBC or uh, uh, the Fox, which are kind of two extremes, is that uh, you're hearing what you want to hear. And if you're going to learn anything, you really hear, need to hear what the other guy is saying too, at least again, in my opinion and then make your own judgment, get both sides and then make your own judgment rather than just listen to one, one thing. Okay, uh, I mentioned, and I should just throw that in again, my, my late wife, uh, she was at KMUW for 38 years, which is the longest of any employee at the station ever. And uh, she mostly worked with the volunteers for like when they do fundraisers and things like this. And I'm proud of that. She, she really, she's a, she's a very revered person there at the station. Okay, let's kick into the golden age of radio. This is, as I said, generally considered to be the 30s and, and 40s. Uh, 
uh, the 50s, which Charles seems to feel is also golden age of radio, but he's wrong. The 50s uh, uh, is when television, of course, started encroaching. And it's interesting because there were programs like, like uh, you had Gunsmoke on the radio and you had it on TV too. And it, it was two different people uh, uh, playing the part. Let me see if I've got that down in my notes so that I can remember. Uh, no, I can't. Well, anyway, of course, it was James Arness with television, and it slips in my mind. I tell people that my data bank is in great shape, but my central processor really runs slowly anymore. Anyhow, uh, so it is really the 30s and 40s because radio started to change in the 50s. It had to because television just took the audience away from things like radio drama and music programs and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but the 30s and 40s, that's when it was a lot of fun because uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of music shows uh, with orchestras. This was the big band era, what have you. And so consequently, why you would hear from high atop the uh, Shea Paris Hotel in downtown Chicago, here's um, uh, Xavier Cugat and his orchestra uh, for an hour's worth of, of, of uh, entertainment music brought to you by Chesterfield cigarettes or whatever. You know, I mean, I'm making this up, but it, uh, that was actually, when I was a little kid, I thought, what is a shade to read? I don't understand this, but the music was nice. Anyway, at the same time, the other thing that happened was radio drama. And, and, and this is why I say it's fun. Now, there's a, there's a guy in the 80s that ran on KMUW called Ken Nordeen, fantastic voice this guy had. And, and he, he had a program called Word Jazz and it was really popular. Um, uh, I can't even begin to describe it, what he was doing, but it was using words and it was using sound and it was using music, sound effects and music uh, to create an atmosphere. And you can really do this with sound. And he talked about theater of the mind. Now, I used to tell my kids when I was teaching, because I had a 30 year uh, teaching career too. When I was teaching, I would say, it, you know, it's a shame that you missed out on radio. Obviously, uh, the, the, the science uh, progresses and the world changes, but it's a shame you missed out on this because of this business of the theater of the mind. What this did. When I'm listening to the Lone Ranger and Tonto around the campfire talking about what they're going to do to stop, you know, whatever the criminal was this time, I'm having to picture that. Yes, I'm hearing the guy play Lone Ranger. I'm hearing the guy play Tonto. I'm hearing a sound effect of crackling uh, fire. And maybe I'm hearing some sort of mood music in the background. And this all helps me but I still have to picture what does the Lone Ranger look like? What does Tonto look like? Well, the Lone Ranger, was a, if, if you've ever seen pictures, these two guys are standing in front of a microphone and they're both wearing suits and they're both white, you know. Um, Tonto was a white man, but he still said, mm -hmm. he was not the uh, sort of thing, uh, and the caricature of, of an Indian at the time. But, but you're having to picture this in your head. And you could do this with so many things. I, I can remember hearing uh, creepy radio programs like The Shadow or something where I could really feel the hair on my arms raising up and stuff because, you know, but it's also I'm seeing this um, because in real life, it's this guy standing in front of a microphone and it's a sound effects man with with guns and with oh, that makes me that makes me think one of the funny things about uh, radio drama was they had this they had this crime show on where this guy's supposed to shoot somebody so the guy says don't sh don't shoot me don't shoot me well the gun misfires for the sound effects man doesn't go off clicks again you know guy says well my gun's jammed wait a second <laughs> the actor's ad living and 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 then, and then uh, uh it clicks again so they says well i guess i'm gonna have to use this knife on and just as he's about to do that, the gun goes off. <laughs> oh, just wonderful stuff. Anyway, uh, that was, but, but again, picturing in your mind, and this is the thing that, that I always found really helped my own creativity is because from a very young age, 
Why, I was having to imagine all of this stuff. What was it like? What was it like on Dimension X to see the spaceship take off? You know? Or to, to hear the humanoids taking over uh, the human civilization? Uh, uh, that sort of thing. And you had to picture, well, what do these guys look like? And so on. So this, to me, is one of the great values of radio uh, that sadly is kind of uh, in the past. But uh, let me go on. Uh, um, oh, yeah, we had Lux Radio Theater. They used to take movies and, and uh, 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 dramatize them on the radio so that like you could have Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall come in and do their movie on there. They, they'd pare it down to an hour or something like that. Uh, and, but but at the same time, why then you get your movie? We used to listen to that and just love it because I was a huge, huge movie fan too. We didn't have television back then. And um, you could go to the movies back then as a kid for 14 cents, which is just fantastic. So I loved the movies too. So I loved that show. But there were also kids shows, for example, which you don't get much. Well, you don't get it all really to my knowledge on the radio anymore. But we had things like uh, uh, Buster Brown's Gang with Smiling Ed McConnell. I don't know if that was actually broadcast out here or not. Some of you older guys could probably answer that. But it came from Chicago. And uh, uh, it was the happy gang of Buster Brown. Buster Brown was shoes. So we had this kid. He heard arf, arf. And then the kid says, that's my dog, Ty. He lives in a shoe. I'm Buster Brown. Look for me in there, too. And then it was the happy gang of Buster Brown is on the air. The happy gang of Buster Brown is on the air. And Smile and Ed had Froggy the Gremlin, who was invisible, but he could make himself visible by plunking his magic twanger. And so great stuff for kids. But another one that was really, uh, really uh, good for that was uh, Let's Pretend. And for little kids, this was really good because it took nursery rhymes, or, or not nursery rhymes, but bedtime stories uh, and, and fables and turned them into radio plays. So you heard Hansel and Gretel and uh, all, all that sort of stuff. And they dramatized them. And that was really nifty. I loved that show. That was on Saturday mornings. That smiling it was on Saturday mornings too. Uh, and I have a memory for junk like this, and I can dig it out. And Nyla Mack was the producer. I know that just sticks in my head because it's kind of an odd name, Nyla. Uh, but that sticks in my head. She was the producer of Let's Pretend. Yeah. And, and uh, let's see. that. Uh, I can't think who that was brought to you by. Well, anyway, uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, take a listen to some of these old radio programs and see if uh, we can't give you, give you a little bit of what it was like. And the first one we're gonna talk about is probably one of the most famous, and that was Orson Welles' uh, 1938 Halloween broadcast of, um, no, 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 yeah, yeah, War of the Worlds. Uh, and and uh, you've heard about this because it, it's actually taking the story about Mars invading the Earth that was written by H.G. Wells, no relation to Orson. And uh, uh, what they did was they started out like one of those music programs I was talking about, somebody in his orchestra. Uh, and then they would interrupt with, uh, we interrupt with this news flash that we've seen um, flashes on the, the, the surface of the planet Mars. And then uh, um, we, we've had meteors landing and this sort of stuff. They'd go back and forth as if it was just, you know, interesting news reports to cut into the show with. Uh, but if, if you've ever heard the, at least the stories, why there was panic, because people were just hearing parts of it, though the, every 15 minutes or so, they would say, this is Mercury theater drama, why people would hear just part of it and think it was the real thing. And so there was panic. Let's just take a listen uh, to a clip out of this. Against the mirror, what's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. He strikes him head on. The logs are turning into flames. Now the whole field's caught up by the woods. The cars are the gas tanks, tanks of the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. 
Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Indelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We continue now with our piano interlude. Okay, uh, that, that shows you a little bit of what that was like. Again, it was AM radio, and that's why the fidelity isn't all that good. But, but uh, this business about nationwide panic is really something of a myth. Uh, it is estimated that only about 2% of the listening audience uh, was even hearing this because there were other programs on the air. Uh, but at the same time, people actually did panic and were leaving cities and things like this because they were afraid Martians were attacking them. Uh, I suppose you could call that the original fake news. <laughs> but at the same time, they weren't trying to scam anybody. It was a question of, of um, uh, that we, we uh, are just presenting a drama here. And, and, and they were really surprised when this happened. But of course, it made Orson Welles' career. Uh, I mean, this guy got so famous from this. Next thing you know, why uh, Hollywood called and he went and made Citizen Kane, which was one of the most unique and... and, and uh, life-changing movies uh, for Hollywood uh, that ever happened. Uh, he's on my all-time favorite director. But anyway, uh, uh, let's move on. Wells also uh, didn't just do that. He participated in some of the regular radio shows. And one of them, he played The Shadow. Now, you've probably heard of The Shadow. He's this person who learned in the Orient the power to cloud men's minds so that he could make himself invisible when he was right there just by somehow, I don't know, telepathy or something, making himself invisible. But this is a great thing to listen to back then. Uh, let's, let's take a clip out of that, please. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Hospital Murder. Lamont, what's it all about? Margaret, my dear, you're yours not to reason why. Yours but to make those pretty feet of yours walk fast and not keep up with me. Yes, but I thought this trip to Egypt was to be a vacation. No more work. No more excitement. <laughs> no more excitement for about two weeks and you'd be having me cut out paper dollies. <laughs> Here we are. Cairo General Hospital. Come on, watch these steps. Will you please tell me what it's all about? Oh, I know. There's a Dr. Rawling phone the hotel and asked me to go over here as fast as I could, so here we are. But who is Dr. Rawling, and, and what's he got to do with you? Dr. Rawling is in charge of this place, old friend of the family. Hmm. It's quiet even for the hospital, isn't it? I don't like it, Lamont. Wait out here for me, Margot. I'll call you if I want to. All right, Lamont. Oh, Lamont. Okay. Uh, that just shows you a little bit, and it shows you some of the sound effects, the knocking on the door and, and opening the door and all that sort of stuff, uh, which is a, a different part of the studio. And again, Lamont or Orson and, and, and the lady playing the part were uh, right there uh, just reading into microphones. Uh, but don't forget this. Listen to how that organ music was in there. Because again, think about how creepy that sounded all that in the shadow. 
the shed on those. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Anyway, uh, let's move on, because uh, I'm going to talk about the music a little bit later. Superman was my favorite hero when I was a kid. He was on the radio as well as being in comic books. And comic books are, what, of course, where I really uh, met Superman. Uh, and then finally, they made a serial at the movies uh, with Superman, too. But, but uh, we listened to it on the radio. And, and let's take a quick listen to some of that, because there's an interesting part of this sort of thing, too. Sir, but if that call did come from the wolf, I should be inclined to believe it. Huh? How do you know who that was? If I were you, I'd warn the officials in charge of the silver clipper. Uh, look here. You couldn't hear that phone. What is this? How do you know who called me? As I was saying, Mr. White... Suppose I brought you a good story. The story of the Silver Clipper and the Wolf. I take chances, Kent. I'm going to take a chance on you. Thank you, Mr. White. It's 2,000 miles. You'll have to hop a plane. I'll get there, Mr. White, in spite of the weather. Lord, I, I hadn't noticed the weather. Well, get to the airport anyway. You rang, Mr. White? Miss Smith, this is Clark Kent, temporarily attached to our staff. You'll note I said temporarily. Yes, sir. Kent leaves for the west for the first plane. Get him tickets and a $200 advance. Mr. White, all planes are grounded. Well, that's all right, sir. I'll get there. Uh, take him outside. Show him what he needs to know. Mr. White, I'd like to thank you. Oh, let it go, Kent. Let it go. You get a story and you get a job. You're either clairvoyant or the luckiest guesser alive. Either way, I can use you. But if you miss out, well... This way, Mr. Kent. Thank you, Miss Smith. Nice of you to show me around. Pretty lucky, I'll say. A hundred good newspaper men walking the streets and you step right into a job. I say, I am lucky. You wait in here. The ante room's the cashier's office. Well, I really don't need an advance. Oh, I... a playboy in disguise, eh? Wait here. Oh, what a rotten night. Don't fall out that window. It's 20 stories down. Beautiful view, even in the fog. You wait right here till I get your money. Then I'll introduce you to a few real newspaper men. Planes grounded. 2,000 miles to go. Sorry, Miss Smith. I'm afraid I can't wait. Clark Kent may need a plane, but Superman doesn't. Up with the window. And out. Get out. I hope I didn't keep you waiting too. Yeah, that's fine. What? Miss Smith. Miss Smith. Oh, what's wrong? That man. Did he go out that Clark? Okay. Now... I, ho I hope you were hearing there where a couple things happened. Bud Collier played Superman. Now, Bud Collier also, uh, if, you, if you are of an age, will remember had a TV show, a game show called Beat the Clock. And that's where he was probably most famous. But he was Superman. You notice a couple things. One, he, he talked like, uh, yes, Miss, Miss Lane, I'm Clark Kent. No, I'm Superman, sort of thing. <laughs> he would change. But then also, they had to describe what they were doing. So he, you know, so you'd have an idea. So this particular part didn't have the off with these clothes as Superman, which uh, used to be a kind of a regular feature. But then he says, up with this window. And then they would have a sound effect of the window going. Because how are you going to know that he's opening the window uh, if, if he doesn't do that? And then he... The, the wind blowing sort of thing that you were hearing there was the sound they always used with him flying. Uh, back in, in 1960, why, why uh, oh, uh, KFH uh, radio gave KMU, it's clean, they were cleaning out their attic or something, gave us a whole big pile of the Cisco Kid shows. And, and the Cisco Kid would, uh, uh, he, he would, get into a fist fight. And again, he would have to describe what he was doing. Now, even as a kid, I thought this was pretty ridiculous because he would say, ah, a right punch to the jaw. Now, another punch to the stomach. <laughs> and you'd hear the sound effects of the smacks and what have you, but he's describing his whole fist fight out loud, <laughs> which, which was just ridiculous. But again, it at least told you what was happening, although you would think in a fist fight, you could hear a bunch of punches, and that would be that sort of thing. He took it really to the extremes. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, we're getting down here, aren't we? Um, Cisco Kid was known as the Robin Hood of the Old West, but the most important... Um, character in the Old West was the one that's most famous for radio drama that everybody has heard about, I'm pretty sure, and that's The Lone Ranger. Uh, I mentioned that a little while ago. Uh, and, and The Lone Ranger uh, was a show that lasted, what was that? I, I, I don't know if I have this in my notes. Yeah, 21 years, 
21 years on the radio. And then, of course, it also became a TV show with Clayton Moore, who I never liked because he was kind of a tenor, and Brace Beamer, who played the Lone Ranger, uh, had a deep voice sort of thing. But whatever the case, uh, let's take a, a, a quick listen uh, to uh, a bit from the Lone Ranger, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about some of that. horse for the speed of light, a cloud of dust and a hearty high o silver, the Lone Ranger. The open range made Wyoming a cattleman's paradise in the early days of the western United States. But as the northern herds grew and the ranchers prospered, they were attacked by bands of outlaws that roamed the new territory. It was the masked rider of the plains, more than any other man, who put an end to rustling and range wars. And without his strength and courage, his daring and resourcefulness, the winning of the West might never have been accomplished. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of his great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. We're heading for the open range. Huddle's waiting for us. I know Silver. Away! Okay, uh, Purple Crows, as a kid, you know, daring and resourceful mass right of the plains fought to bring law and order to the early Western United States. Nowhere could you find a greater champion of justice. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hokey, but it really worked. And one of the things that made it work, too, was the William Tell Overture playing there in the background. I mean, I can't hear the William Tell Overture without thinking Lone Ranger, and I, I think probably a great part of the American public who was exposed to that feels the same way. Well, here's an interesting thing. The, the Lone Ranger uh, wanted to use um, like orchestras, but orchestras were really expensive for just typical radio show and particularly a kid's radio show. And, and yet you couldn't use recordings. You may uh, have also heard about, well, you heard earlier the the organ with the shadow that, that I mentioned, don't forget that. The organ was used in a lot of shows, like soap operas are famous for having the organ playing for their music. And the reason why is because you weren't having to pay a bunch of musicians, you paid just one person. Uh, the romance of Helen Trent soap opera even had uh, a guy who just hummed the theme every day, which was really bizarre. But, but anyway, uh, Lone Ranger wanted to have better music than that, but they couldn't get, and, and the union was really tight on, and the musicians union was really tight. They're, they're a good, strong union. They were really tight about this. So what are you gonna do? Well, what they did was they sent some guys to Europe and, and they hired orchestras in Europe, and of course paid them once uh, to record classical music they used throughout the show. And so consequently, uh, then they bring the records back and they start using this on the show. Well, the musicians union took them to court over it, but eventually they lost. And this is one of the ways that rec recorded music was actually able to be used on the radio. And, and so then we reached a point where you're licensed to ASCAP and BMI, uh, uh, Broadcast Music Incorporated, the American Society of uh, Producers. Uh, I can't remember all of that. Anyway, and, and stations have to pay a fee for this, but it is, it is minimal. And all the stations add up is how anybody makes any money from it on the national scene. But the Lone Ranger was the one who established this business of being able to use records for stuff. So again, uh, what a tremendous era uh, that whole thing was, and I dearly love it much. And, and we've only got about five minutes left, but if, if you have questions and answers, I'll do my best. Although, again, I point out that uh, the old bean doesn't work as well as it used to. Uh, 
Lance Rob asks, did I hear correctly that KMUW was the first public station in the country? Yes. No, it was the first uh, FM public station in the country. Ah. I was wondering what the distinction was. Um, yeah. One of one of my one of my KMUW memories, very important to me growing up, was the after midnight program. Actually, <laughs> I, I had actually I had that in my notes to mention. Uh, that, that was one that appealed to everybody your age, Charles, except the administration and the university. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it was a problem when I was program director. Why I was dealing with these kids all the time, and it was a problem because this is the point where you know, the First Amendment started coming into music and, and you heard all sorts of language that actually could not be played on the radio because of the uh, public or the profanity and decency and obscenity clauses uh, from the FCC. And you could lose your license if you did this. Now, a lot of that has been deregulated. You hear all sorts of language anymore, not just on the radio, but certainly on TV and what have you. But yeah, this was a problem. We had, we had to actually audition the music and tell kids what they could play, and they didn't like that at all. And every once in a while, they would violate it. And then I would hear from the uh, dean of liberal arts, and, and we'd have to go to the office and stuff. Like that. <laughs> but but it, yeah, it was cutting edge stuff. And the kids just, have, well, you know, when you have kids volunteering to come in at one o'clock in the morning and do a radio show, that's something. So. Indeed, indeed. I can remember, I can't even say a couple of the song titles that were very popular in the summers in the early 80s with try, folks trying to get the KMUW after, after midnight DJs to play. Um, Sharon says she loves Sunday nights with Fibber McGee and Molly and Amos and Andy. Yeah. What station would that have been on? Well, I can't. Broadcasting, maybe? Yeah, I can't tell you here. Um, but of course, Amos and Andy because it was doing caricatures of African-Americans. It was the most popular nighttime radio show on the air for a very long time. And I have to tell you, it was funny, but you know, it's also somewhat demeaning because it was doing these caricatures and stereotypes of black people. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate because you know it used to be the same thing with movies, you didn't have that many uh, black people that had any kind of consequence in a movie, except as a server or something of that nature. And, and so I used to think even back then that when I was a kid, that, you know, there was no, nobody for little black kids to look up to in the movie sort of thing. Uh, the way I looked up to say Gene Autry or something like that. Uh, and, and, but yeah, Amos and Andy was an incredibly popular show. And when they showed up, they worked in blackface and stuff like this. They didn't, of course, when they were just doing the radio show. But I mean, it really was the kind of thing that you, you couldn't. Well, they tried to do it on TV and they started coming under scrutiny for that. And so then uh, they quit and they turned it into uh, Calvin and uh, the something where it was two animals who were doing the same it was a fox and, and something else that were doing this, this uh, same routine, except that they were, were animals performing the, the, the Amos and Andy dialogue, rather, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, that, that was a popular show. Any other questions? Well, Janine asks, whatever happened to WRRS? Which means, I, I, I'm not sure I know what WRRS is. Do you, do you? Well, I would assume it's a radio station, but yeah, but that is probably a local radio station. And I actually have no idea. Uh, I can't think of, I've ever heard of that as being a local radio station. But, uh, and Rob asks, and Janine, I should say, if you can send me some clarification about that, I will gladly impart it. Um, Rob also asks, would you talk about Radio Luxembourg as a pirate station in Europe? Does that, does that ring a bell? Uh, well, that, that sort of thing actually did happen. There were a number of pirate stations, you know, they, they would be on a ship perhaps uh, out in, yeah. in, uh, in uh, international waters, uh, but still close enough because uh, London had at least two of these broadcasts. Ah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's about all I can tell you because, of course, I didn't experience that or ever really hear any of it, except that it was one of these things that people wanted to shut down. And they were doing, in essence, American DJ radio. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah. 
Janine said, uh, Janine has a clarification. And now I know, now I recognize what she's talking about. Uh, WRRS was the reading service for the blind. Oh, the radio reading service. That, and okay. that volunteers, in, include, including Janine, would read at the KMW offices on 13th Street. Yes, because um, my wife actually operated that for two or three years, I think it was. And, and it was all volunteers coming in, reading the newspaper or magazines or whatever for sight impaired people. And if you were sight impaired, well, you could get this special radio because it was a frequency that nobody else could get. And you could, you could take one on loan from KMUW. Yeah. And, and it was a great service. Well, they finally, uh, somewhere along the way in administration of the radio station, and that was before the current administration, which is the best administration they ever had at that radio station. But uh, somewhere along the way, they decided it was expensive to pay somebody like my wife to, to run that aspect. My wife still hung in doing other things. But uh, uh, so consequently, why they uh, switched over to KU's radio reading service. And then I don't think they're even doing that anymore. Well, actually, the library, the uh, the um, talk, the talking books program for the library went to uh, Emporia State some uh, time ago, and it's it's managed from from elsewhere in the state. Yeah. But um, let's see. Any any you know, I, I think I probably do overrate the fifties as a, and and even the sixties for radio because we uh, we grew up with little access to television uh, for moral and financial reasons combined probably and uh so i was really reliant on the radio uh through this through the much of the 70s for a lot of things well and I the am radios would still do the the horror radio from the 40s and stuff they'd play well, them every day you know charles when i was a kid why we were really quite poor and so uh i didn't have a television set in the house and it was a used tv when we got it until i was a junior in high school yeah uh, yeah. and, and that would have been 1955. TV had been around for quite a while by then. But uh, uh, so radio was terribly important right up to yeah. that point. But it did, of course, transition into a lot of DJ shows. And then AM radio yeah. has gone to talk radio and yeah, uh, so many changes in it. But radio is still a very important medium. Yeah. And Wolfman Jack was amazing then, actually, in oh, my childhood. That yeah. was... I still remember listening to him, uh, hearing, uh, playing the Doors Crystal Ship. That's one of my first radio memories from probably 1969. <laughs> Seriously. Well, uh, uh, a guy that I was in college with, Brad, uh, I can't think, but he became Wolfman Jack's manager for mm. a long time. And that was coming out of Texas too, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I saw, I stumbled over in a thrift store recently. Um, question uh a uh, albums of wolf met for for military services to be sent to be sent overseas to vietnam ah. record uh multiple lp sets of his radio shows to be sent to vietnam i was just kind of dazzled by that well is, you mean it's like vinyl recordings exactly yeah. exactly but for the troops only and in kind of a in kind of a generic rapper but clear but but with the u.s military label logos and his uh -huh. Yeah. yeah, well, see, the, it used to be that, like the, the uh, Cisco Kid programs that we got from KFH were what they called uh, electronic transcriptions, is what they called. And they were records that were about 16 inches wide, as yeah. opposed to a 12-inch LP. And then it played from the inside out. So you had to have a special machine to do that. But we had one of those there at KMUW, and so we were able to go ahead and broadcast some of those old Cisco Kid programs. Indeed. Well, our last question is from Rob, and he says, how about the use of propaganda on the radio in World War II? We were just talking about Armed Forces Radio. So yeah. yeah, yeah. This this is certainly something that wasn't just restricted to radio, mm. uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it, primarily, well, one of the things it did that our government did was uh, uh, use a racial approach to the Japanese and condemn them for being these yellow, whatever, and so on. And you got that in, in both radio and uh, the movies at the time, which uh, is just an astounding sort of thing. Um, I have an old Batman serial that was made in 1942, where it starts out showing empty stores there in, in uh, what, San Francisco or LA. 
that uh, they say, well, these Japanese have been put in the concentration camps where they should belong, you know, sort of thing. Uh, and, and, and there was that kind of propaganda. It, yeah. it fired people up like this. But somehow, since the Germans were white, well, we didn't use racial stuff with them. But, but uh, no, the, the, those were very different times. Uh, well, and, and, and that's sad. One of the things, though, that I noticed in listening to a lot of the uh, the Armed Forces radio from the World War II era was that there was a totally different, there was a very different standard for risque content. You know, the servicemen got, uh, uh, you know, a, a cruder, more or less civious product, <laughs> which was sometimes a lot of fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But at any rate, I think we've run out of time today. <laughs> it's great to see you again. Um, well, I want to thank you and, and, and Sarah both for having me on. I really appreciate that. It's been great. Uh, thank you, everyone else, too, for participating in today's program. We've shared a link in the chat to a quick survey. It may take a few minutes to load, but please take the time to complete this. We look at each survey and use these to help plan future programs. Future programming ideas are always welcome. Your feedback is valuable. And thanks again to Lance Hayes for this nostalgic journey through American radio. And thank you for your support for the Wichita Public Library. This ends today's Senior Wednesday program. We'll see you next month for Somos de Wichita with Dr. Enrique Navarro. See our website for more information, www.wichitalibrary.org events. Thank you so much. This concludes the recording. <laughs>